Good morning, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to um, our ninth annual State of the City Address. Um, delighted to see you all here this morning. My name is Tim Sink. I'm president of the Greater Concord Chamber of Commerce. Um, I want to make a special thanks to Cleveland Waters and Bass for uh, generously sponsoring this program, which they've done for a number of years. So please uh, join me in showing appreciation to that Cleveland Waters and Bass. Um, before we get started this morning, uh, we have a, a little, a nice surprise, um, a, an award that will be given out. And David Wood, uh, who is a longtime friend of the chamber and a former nationally recognized construction writer, is here to present this year's New Hampshire Construction Industry Ethics Award. So please welcome David Wood. The New Hampshire Construction Industry Ethics Award honors the individual business or organization that through its words and deeds best demonstrates a commitment to upholding the highest ethical standards in construction. This is the 20th year that the award has been presented. A resident of Chichester for the past 40 years, Frank LeMay boasts more than four decades of construction and engineering experience. He began his career with his uncle's paving business at age 15, working there through high school and while attending Northeastern University, where he earned a bachelor's degree in civil engineering. After two years with Massachusetts O'Donnell Construction, he spent a decade with R.C. Foss and Sons, rising to vice president and stockholder. In 1988, LeMay and a partner founded Milestone Engineering and Construction, growing it from an eight by 10 office into what is today one of New Hampshire's most respected construction firms. Known for its loyalty and exceptional treatment of its employees, Milestone staff members average 14 years with the company. LeMay now shares ownership with his son Jeffrey and three other longtime managers. Clients, architects, subcontractors, and competitors all praise the manner in which LeMay conducts his business. Milestone is Brewster Academy's primary contractor, says Lisa Braderman, the school CEO, CFO. And the reason is that we know Frank and all his supervisors and project managers deal with us honestly and directly, don't hide any issues or problems, and work hard to ensure that our projects are performed safely, correctly, and within our budget and timetable. New Hampshire Distributors is another longtime client. From the time the concept is born, Frank is there learning all he can about our business and our needs, helping us design and produce a finished product that exceeds those needs, says Senior Vice President Tom Panshaw. Frank gives us options. As is often the case, the options Frank suggests are not the most expensive, but rather the most practical. I cannot say enough about the integrity of Frank LeMay and Milestone. Frank brings a rare combination of experience, dependability, and good humor to every project, according to Barry Brenzinger of, of LaValle Brenzinger Architects. His trustworthiness is beyond reproach. He has built a very successful business on partnerships with owners and architects that are founded upon fairness and always doing what's right. In fact, when LaValle Brenzinger needed a CM for its own offices, Frank was our unanimous choice. Ken Duchesne is Vice President of Granite State Plumbing and Heating. I've had the honor of knowing Frank since 1991, and he has never wavered from being sincere and forthright. His consistent display of respect and honesty to all is refreshing. His word is his bond, and he has always embraced doing what is right for all parties, not just milestone. LeMay has also earned the respect of his competitors. Frank is among the most outstanding people I've ever come across in our business, says Rob Prunier, Executive Vice President of Harvey Construction. Not only does he conduct himself with integrity and trustworthiness that is needed in our business, but he also possesses a unique talent to connect with people. I've always admired his ability to talk with people one-on-one -on -one, as well as command their respect and trust. 
LeMay is an active supporter of our community. He has served on the boards of Catch Neighborhood House, Second Start, where he is a past president, and the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, as well as having been the BIA representative to the New Hampshire Lakes Management Advisory Committee, an advisor to Kimball Jenkins School of Art, and a member of the Concord Hospital Business Partners in Health Committee. He has chaired numerous building committees in Chichester and has also coached youth soccer. In addition to the award itself, the award carries with it a $1,000 donation to the recipient's charity of choice. Frank has requested that that donation be split among Second Start and the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great privilege to introduce the recipient of this year's New Hampshire Construction Industry Ethics Award, Frank LeMay. Thank you very much. Um, I asked Tim what he expected me to do here, and he quoted Shakespeare and said, brevity is the soul of wit. <laughs> and then he emailed me that quote yesterday. <laughs> With that, just quickly, um, I guess I'm smart enough to know that I can't do it with other people, and I've got my four other stockholders here today, uh, David Beer, Mark Goldstein, uh, Jeff LeMay, and Brian Garris. And um, basically, if they don't follow through with everything, I'm just another contractor who didn't say, do what he said he was going to do. <laughs> so I, I really, for them and all the other employees, we've got a lot of dedicated employees. So I just really want to thank them. Uh, when I look out here, I see a number of my clients. And uh, when I, uh, probably when I went into this business, I realized real quick if I didn't have clients that had the same thought and vision that I did, that I was in a lot of trouble because when you try and treat people fairly and they try not to treat you fairly, you, you usually end up on the short end. So I, I set about trying to find good clients and I see a lot of them out here today and I thank you. And then there's just four people and I'll be done. <laughs> My mom and dad, great parents, uh, great foundation, um, just very ethical people. Um, I came up in the depths of the Depression and fought their way through. My father was in the Battle of the Bulge and uh, started a small business. And at eight years old, I was working the counter in the business in, in a small grocery store. So I learned that value. At uh, 15, he said, I went to my uncle's paving business. And at 15, I became a small roller man. It was a guy with the duck feet with a small roller. Uh, rolling the 400-degree as asphalt on a 95-degree day. Now, today, that's child abuse. <laughs> but I loved it. I loved it. And, and my Uncle Dick, he's alive today. He's 85. I called him last week, and he was out estimating driveways. And, and last summer, you know, they were short of drive. He was driving a 10-wheeler. And I tell him he's the only 85-year-old truck driver. He's the best 85-year-old truck driver I know, and he's also the only one I know. So. <laughs> But, and um, so they, they've just uh, been really good in uh, sh shaping everything. And last but not least, my wife, Joyce. I mean, uh, we've been married 39 years, and when you own a business, you're always coming home late. You've always got something to do on Saturday, and she's been w with me, you know, the whole way. So I love her and uh, really thank her, too. That's my final big thank you. So thank you very much. <laughs> Frank, so well deserved. Congratulations. I have been asked to uh, keep introductions to a minimum this morning by our speakers, so I will, I will honor that, but I will do a brief introduction. The way this is going to work, uh, the mayor and the city manager will come up, they will make a presentation, there will be some time for Q&A at the end, so, um, uh, so please take advantage of that. I will first introduce uh, Mayor Jim Boulay. He has been, um, he was a, a city councillor uh, beginning in 1998, and became uh, mayor for the first time in 2007. So he has served a number of terms. He's a partner with the law firm Dennehy & Boulay, which is a governmental consulting firm, uh, graduate of UNH uh, in 1998, in 1988, sorry, Jim, I just took a few years off your life. <laughs> and he resides in East Concord with his wife, Tara Reardon, who is also with us this morning. 
City Manager Thomas Spell was born in Lowell, Massachusetts and grew up in that area. Received a bachelor's degree in government and a master's degree in public administration, both from Suffolk University, and a certificate in state and local government from the Kennedy School of uh, the Kennedy School of, uh, at Harvard University. Following college, he worked in Londonderry as director of planning and economic development, director of public works, and assistant to the town administrator. Tom was recruited to Concord in 1998 and served as the city's first director of community development in 2001, was appointed assistant city manager, and has served as city manager since 2005. Um, so please welcome Mayor Jim Boulay and City Manager Thomas Bell. Morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. There we go. All right. Um, so, how do I usually start? Another beautiful day in the city. Welcome to another great day in the city of Concord. <laughs> there you go. Um, now, my son and I have a bet. So after this line, we're going to see what happens. You ready? I am happy to report that the state of the city is strong. <laughs> there you go. So the bet was, he said, he goes, Dad, do you think when you say that, like in Congress, they're all going to stand up and applaud, and half the room will sit down, and then they'll stand up. And... <laughs> so you, that was not bad. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Um, I want to start by saying this. Um, so yesterday was a very big day, I think, in the city of Concord and in relationships with the state. Uh, we started the morning off in a, a hearing before the Senate talking about uh, trying to keep the doors open in the State House. Uh, so to improve, I think, our relationship with uh, tourists that come to the state, uh, to help with our hotels, our businesses uh, that really depend upon that tourism dollar and such. And um, the chamber was there, and they made a huge difference in pushing forward this initiative. Uh, I can remember when there was a race for Senate, and I think it was a, a debate here in this room. And uh, you, the chamber, got a commitment out of the candidates running and said, you know, will this be a priority for, priority for you? And they followed through. So it was really great to see uh, the Senate take an affirmative vote yesterday uh, to, to keep the doors of the State House open or, or to at least put together a memorandum. And I give Tim and the chamber a tremendous amount of credit to make that happen. So that was number one. And number two, the afternoon, got to spend some more quality time together. Um, but the chamber and many members of the, this community really saw the importance, like, like the city council, of keeping the Merrimack County Courthouse downtown. Um, not only is it important for the downtown, but it's important for your tax dollars. I mean, this is a huge investment that the, the state makes. There were $400,000 in lease payments, and if that money dries up, well, the, your county taxes potentially go up. So this is, this is important for lots of reasons. The vitality, I think the prominence of the judiciary and such. But to keep it down, and the chamber was there once again in the afternoon, uh, testifying in support and keeping that courthouse downtown, and, and I just want to say thank you, Tim, to make that happen. Now. Yeah. Yes, yes. <clears throat> All right, so here's my quick story. Um, so uh, w there was one gentleman who wasn't crazy about the courthouse downtown, and one of the things he complained about was that um, uh, there wasn't enough parking enforcement in the city. <laughs> okay? Um, and so I, I tried to respond to that. And, we walked out of the hearing, and the hearing lasted, I think, close to two hours or so. And it was about 5.30, quarter, six by the time we walked out of there. And I'm walking across the street, and what do I hear? I hear Steve Dupree yelling at me, I can't believe I got a ticket! <laughs> so I just yelled back, thank you, and just kept on going. So I turned the corner, I started heading down Main Street, and uh, many of you remember, um, who has turned out to be a really good friend of mine, John Cook. We ran against each other a couple times for, uh, for mayor. And I ran into John on the street and he says, Mayor, Mayor, did you see Dupree? I said, <laughs> I did, I did. He goes, he goes, did he complain about his ticket? I go, he did. How did you know that? He goes, because I put it there. <laughs> he goes, I looked at his vehicle. He was over the line by this much. So he goes, I put a ticket there. And so, sure enough, this morning, Tom and I are, are doing our last minute preparations. With this, even the superintendent noticed that we were writing our speech at the last minute. <laughs> Brother Dupree comes over and goes, I can't believe I got a ticket. I go, did you open it? No. He opens it. There's no ticket. I go, yeah, that's John Cook, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Concord, my friends. <clears throat> All right, you ready? 
So today, Tom and I are going to break this up a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, renewed uh, focus on academic development we've started in the city, uh, talk a little bit about the Main Street Complete Streets Project, and public safety. And then Tom will follow along with the financials and the, um, the major capital projects. In terms of uh, efforts around economic development, I want to pick out a few topics to just to, uh, to highlight, uh, to tell you there's a lot of things going on in the city, things you may not see. But last Monday night, the City Council uh, took the initiative to expand 79E, which is a tool that many developers have used. And you can see here um, the former electric, uh, the Hoyt Electric property in Pentecook, Endicott Hotel, Smile, uh, Remy's Block, that's the former Vegas Block, have all successfully used 79E. Um, but we, what we did as a council, we tried to expand that and hopefully would encourage um, historic re um, renovations as well as economic development. So what we did is it, you could use 79A as a tool, but kind of freezing the taxes where they were, holding them in place, allowing the developer to go to do the project, and then eventually uh, would the, uh, the tax would go back up to what it normally would be assessed for. Um, it, it's, a, it's a nice tool to have. And, um, but we were finding that there were properties outside the district that we, we had um, originally put together that were in need of or potential use of these dollars. And um, by expanding it, what we said was, if you are able to be on the National Re Register of Historic Properties, um, then you'd be eligible for this. So for instance, um, some of the examples of what might be able to use in the future would be like Sacred Heart Church. We, w we wouldn't want to lose that, right? Um, uh, the former uh, Summer Street School in Pentecook, uh, Eastman School, uh, St. Peter's Church. I mean, just to kind of name a few to give you an idea of where it can be used. And these are all, I'm sure, buildings we can agree upon we don't want to lose. So that was one initiative. The second is, I don't think people realize that the city has a, a revolving loan fund. And this is nothing, we, we're not looking to compete with our financial service industry here in Concord. But usually, we're, this is kind of a gap financing for people, uh, maybe uh, some people who are, are lower income. But I think it's, it's nice to note that we have uh, 26 uh, loans in our portfolio now, over a million dollars. And it's really kind of where that last resort, um, but 22 housing um, uh, expansions or improvements, renovations. That's when you, you, get a, you get a group that comes to us and says, our, our roof is leaking and we're desperate. We don't know what to do. We need to, can, can you help us over the hump? So we have over um, $700,000 there. Social service, you can see that with child care. We all know how important child care is, particularly when you're taking your child and all of a sudden they say, we're closing our doors. I've been there. Um, over you know, uh, 250000 And of course, uh, you'll notice this, that we have another two pending loans for daycares and, and transportation. I want to talk to you just a really briefly about Two projects, um, and I picked them out specifically as they were downtown. A lot of focus are on our downtown these days. Uh, but the point of the, these two projects I want to talk about specifically is these are the type of things that would, I believe would not have happened but for the city's involvement in creating that partnership with the private sector. So here you have the Endicott Hotel back in 2013, $4.6 million project, formerly 36 affordable unit, uh, houses, housing units. Um, we had a fire. Um, our fire department did a great job in saving the uh, building. And um, it's obviously been renovated into a, a really uh, a shining star on the corner of uh, Main Street. But 27 market rate apartments and three storefronts. You can see, and what I want to point out here is the city involvement. Here you have um, not only a uh, use of 79E, but you also have a loan for $150,000. Um, and of course, negotiating the, uh, the formal thing. So that city involvement, I think, is was critical to that project. And hopefully now you get a nice picture of, of what it is now. I think that's Thomas Bell coming out of Live Juice, if you look closely at the <laughs> picture there. The other project, uh, the Remy Block, this is the one formerly known as the, the Vegas Block. Another a $4 million project, um, bringing in, uh, previously it was 32 units. It was condemned by the state of New Hampshire. People get confused. They always kind of, why did you do that? It was actually the state fire marshal who did that. Uh, but I think it's being renovated, and I think Remy's doing a, a great job in really putting a lot of effort into these 20, uh, 20 units of market rate housing, and then he'll be doing storefront, uh, commercial storefronts on the bottom as well. And you can see where the city again was involved with a, uh, a loan, over 200,000, uh, RSA 79E, once again, another tool was used again. And um, um, why don't you just flip the next one? You'll notice that um, the city had to license, you see these little balconies on the front, that's kind of a new touch. Uh, the city had to license those balconies um, into the right away. And also, we're working with Remy on, um, on parking solutions to make it work. 
He's going fast. Okay. Um, I put this slide in because I thought it was interesting. I was listening to uh, my friend, the mayor of Manchester, talk about how the city of Manchester was catching up and they were going to consider a new permitting uh, software system. So I said, let's put the slide in. Um, this summer, our permitting, new permitting uh, system will be going in place. And um, it's, I'm, I'm proud of this because we've been working a long time, but you know, we really in the city are trying to invest in technology. We recognize that we have to keep up with what you're doing in the private sector. Um, and if, you know, you can't go stand in lines anymore. You're expecting us to participate online just like you, you do. So this uh, hopefully will make it a whole lot easier for um, and save time for those people who are um, looking into development, whether it be the, the uh, small home uh, builder or the large developer. I also wanted to note that on Monday night at our city council meeting, we had a big night Monday night, by the way. I think we spent over uh, 8.5 million. It took us about five minutes. And then we argued, <laughs> we argued about uh, $42,000, whether we should uh, get uh, new golf carts. That, that, took, that took like a half hour, but we spent 8.5 like that. So. Anyway, sorry. Um, also on the Monday night, <laughs> welcome to city council. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> proposed regulations. I just want to point this out that uh, we're having a hearing uh, next month and we're constantly looking at our, our, our regulations and reviewing them and saying, what, what can we do to get out of the way of the development process and make it easier, more streamlined, uh, and make sure we get those developments that we want to see in the city. And here's an example where we're trying to remove a requirement to undergo the minor site plan review for property owners would, you know, look at, you can see the minimal traffic impacts and where there's no site work and it would, it would otherwise trigger a project. So um, you know, we are, believe it or not, government doesn't always try to get in the way. We try to get out of the way at times. Uh, you probably heard it during the election, which uh, seemed like it was yesterday for me, a long time ago, but uh, we talked a lot about economic development, and that's what you're going to find over the next uh, year and a half, two years, that this city council is really going to focus on. This is, this is the number one priority. Uh, the council sat down in January and talked about the priorities, and this was absolutely number one. Um, <clears throat> so I went out and reached out to several organizations with it, within the community and said, tell me what you think a good economic development plan would look like. And our, our own, uh, we refer to it as EDAC, or Economic Development Advisory Committee, got together and they said, look, we want you to have, uh, we, need you, we want you to put the plan together first. And look, look long, longer term, don't just think you know, next year, one to three to five years. But we also think you need to create an economic development um, director type position within the city. Uh, I also reached out to the Concord Young Professionals. Um, okay, I'll have to last, I actually took this from their slide. So these young people are so busy I said, three vision points is four points. They, they, were, they were texting at the time. Um, so they talk about expanding the vitality, about ensuring the health and diversity of business, talking about providing employment opportunities and expanding tax base and maintaining the, uh, the high quality of life. So I, I really appreciated their efforts um, to, to participate. And of course, um, the chamber, as, as uh, you've always participated, you stepped up immediately. Um, I don't think I need to read them all, but I, the, the chamber was key into, I think, putting this whole plan together. And I think it will be, the chamber will be important going forth in how we actually uh, form this, um, this plan. One of the, the key ones I want to talk about is the third bullet down is creating the economic development strike force. And this is a term I hopefully you're going to hear a whole lot more about in the next coming year. And that is, you know, we, we can't rely on in the old days where um, businesses used to just come to the city and said, hey, we want to locate here. We have to be a lot more active. We have to be a lot more strategic. And if you look around the country, what the folks who've been successful, are when you, you take those people within the community, the key institutions, if you will, whether it be education, uh, health care, um, finance, et cetera, and bring those people together and then go out to those businesses and actually say, here we are. We have everything you need to bring your businesses to our great city. So that strike force is going to be something I think you're going to hear a whole lot more. And I think to be effective, that's what we're going to need to do. Of course, um, <clears throat> I talk a lot about Main Street. You all enjoy it, right? Yes. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Even the skeptics come up to me now and then and say, yeah, not so bad. All right. <laughs> right? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Um, so as you know, we're now on to the second phase and um, the, all the calls, complaints have been shifted now to the south end of Main Street. So <laughs> the people in the north end, you can now call and say thank you if you wish. Um, but uh, there's, there's a lot of things going on. I think that uh, Monday night you probably followed. We also decided to spend $2 million to bury the underground or put the utilities uh, underground for a portion of, of the street. 
I love, this is my favorite picture because notice in the, in the first picture is kind of like dab, gray kind of sky. <laughs> but afterwards it's blue, it's shiny, and everything's good. Um, so, I, and, I, and, I, and I just, I think I need to address, um, you know, the one thing that a lot of people have talked about is, well, why didn't you take it further? Why didn't you go all the way down to the Capital Center of the Arts? And I think the council actually would have and, and wanted to. There was, there was a lot of sediment to want to do that. Um, unfortunately, you know, the money wasn't so much the issue. It was, it was a lot of it was the timing. And uh, I had heard from many of the, uh, the merchants, uh, the, the south end of town, that, you know, you, you, it would take us out into the calendar year uh, 2017 if we were going to go down that far. far. Um, and I think, you know, we had, I feel like I'd made a promise to um, the merchants down in that end of town that we'd try to get this over as quickly as possible, and I want to keep my word. Um, I think that uh, it's something that, you know, it, it would be wise to do now and make the investment, but so if there's something we can do to, I think, keep it within this year, um, we still should evaluate it and such, but for right now, it's, it's, it only goes so far. Um, the next thing I think you'll see we've talked about a lot in this project is the wayfinding signs. And, um, you know, kind of at the entry points of downtown, that was one of the concerns when we started this whole project is that we really need to do a better job with our signage. Um, this was the plan, uh, these type of signs, next one, where these were the type of signs that we all agreed upon. We had public hearings. And, uh, I'm not the guy who picks out this stuff, but um, uh, this was, there was uh, several choices, and these were kind of the theme that we went with. Um, I want you to know as to be a full-service mayor, <clears throat> between the public hearings yesterday, I decided to go get a sandwich, and as I was getting a sandwich, I noticed there was a gentleman who uh, was out front of uh, like Barley House area uh, putting up the first sign. So I decided to go out and ask him if you need me to help to make sure it was straight, and he just looked at me like, I don't know who you are, and I think you need to move along type. And I was like, <laughs> but it looks really good. So, so watch for the new signs that will be going up this year. Last thing I want to talk about is there's a lot of good things going on in the city, but you know, I want to talk about public safety because I often talked about we, we live, and I, and I truly believe when I, when I talk to folks, that we live in a very safe community. And um, it, it's a different feel than a lot of other parts of the state. And I, and I think that our, our, our fire department, our police department have a significant reason for really that, that feeling of safety we have. But I want to point some of these things out. In this particular slide, the, the two things I want to point out really are um, the aggravated assaults and the larceny theft at the bottom. You'll notice that it went from 909 to 1132, for instance. These are the two lines that I think are really directly related to the opioid problem and drug, drug abuse. Those are the two lines that you really should pay attention to. Next one. I hate when people read to me PowerPoints, but I want to go through these just, just to make sure I can emphasize these. These are... <laughs> I always like to uh, do this as kind of more of a, a test. I, I, I asked uh, people, you know, how many, you know, we now have a, a box, a drop box in our, our police station. And uh, I always like to ask, you know, how much do you think we actually collect per month? And um, of course, the slide gives it away, but I was amazed that we had collected 142 pounds of drugs. This is people voluntarily going into our police station and dropping off those pills. It's just amazing to me. It's like 20, 28 pounds or so, you know, per. Uh, Per month, it just did anybody think it was that high? I had no idea. Uh, one of the things we are finding, though, is is that um, people are taking advantage and putting things in that they shouldn't. And um, one of the issues is with uh, hypodermic needles; they're sticking them in there, and we obviously don't want to, that to happen. But there are other ways to properly dispose of those things. Uh, but that's that's a lot of prescription drugs that are being left. Um, these are the average statistics um, per month over the past uh, 12 months. Um, and these are not a spike. This is really what we see um, per month. 600 criminal offenses are reported, 243 individuals arrested each month, 27 domestic violence arrests each month, nine felonies reported, and that's 15% of all the crime. The 27 uh, domestic violence, I think, is really scary for me personally. Um, you may got a good chuckle out of Tom and I, and I think a lot of the people in this room who uh, wear the high heels and do the walk a mile in their shoes, um, that's why we do it. Make, we need to continue to talk about this issue. Uh, a few more statistics I wanted to just go over quickly. In 2015, we saw 259 individuals arrested for drug offenses. It's up 25% um, since we saw it in 2012. First three months of 2016, 99 individuals arrested for drug offenses. 
And I, and I did put, you know, we can't rest our way out of this epidemic, and I really strongly believe that. Um, we saw that hope is going to come to the city. I think that's a wonderful thing, um, but it's, it's important. We have a great uh, system with our not only public safety, but our hospital and Riverbend and such. Um, it's a great network, but it's, it's, we're not going to rest our way out of this. Um, the aggravated assaults and larceny, I talked about that, and dramatically up. In response, we've done a lot of things in response, but one thing I just simply want to point out to you was uh, we refer to it as POP. It's the problem-oriented oriented policing. These are two individuals who are simply just dedicated to um, going out, making connections with the community. They work with the code folks and fire and uh, probation, parole, DCYF, and, and, and really creating a, a personal relationship with those business owners, uh, with the people on the street, so that when things happen, it, it's, it's amazing how fast we're able to solve some of the crimes because of those relationships we're building with our POP unit. Uh, and next year, hopefully, we'll be able to fully fund those uh, things. The next is you hear a lot about Narcan, and I really wanted to put a perspective on uh, kind of where we are in the city because you hear a lot about Manchester. Manchester is clearly the highest numbers in the state. This is for use of all of 2015. Um, you know, Concord's kind of average. We're, we're uh, you notice Laconia, Manchester, seem to, Nashua seem to be your highest. Um, Concord's, we're there, but, um, and it can't be underestimated, but I just wanted to kind of put a perspective on it as well. Um, Emergency statistics. We have a very, very busy fire department. And the number I want you to all really focus on here is the total number in 2015. We broke the 8,000 mark last year for calls for service in our fire department. That is a huge, huge number. We have a very active, busy fire department. Um, I, you know, one of the things I actually listened to the chief talk about is what, 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 uh, what is the demand? And there's, you know, there's a lot of issues, but one of the demands I want to look at is it's, the, it's really the EMS. I mean, the EMS calls just continue to do this. And uh, one of the biggest uh, issues we see are slip and falls amongst our elderly. That's one of the biggest demands. And you can see when people talk about our aging population, there's a direct relationship to, to emergency services here. The next statistic I just wanted to, to point out real quickly. Um, you know, we, we, as I said, we do hear a lot about uh, the, the opioids and such, and you can't minimize that. But I want you to see this chart where the, really the, de the huge demand for um, uh, services is the psychiatric and the behavioral emergencies. It takes a lot of time and resources from our fire department. I think you do an amazing job at working with people, making sure that they're getting to their uh, safe place that they need to be, uh, having a great relationship with the hospital, having a great relationship with Riverbend to make sure that... Um, that everyone in this category really it deserves the, the respect and, and the gets the, the proper care that they need. Um, but I just want to point out it's a huge demand that we see. That brings me to uh, Tom's portion. Um, okay, who, who understands slow jamming the news? Does anybody know what that is? Anybody? Nobody saw this skit? So Jimmy Fallon, anybody see Jimmy Fallon? He did this thing where he, he actually, he gave, he gave the news and the president stood behind him and interpreted what he said. So <laughs> next year, we're thinking Tom and I should do this, where he'll get up and do the financials, and I'll stand behind him and go, yeah, we're, we're in big trouble. We're just <laughs> 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 Anyways, thank you, everyone. Good morning. The, um, we decided to take the financials, which we traditionally have in maybe a dozen slides or so and break that down into two slides. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint all the people from uh, the accounting firms and whatnot because they get really excited by this, but uh, um, uh, Brian LeBron and Katie Graff helped me put this together. And it's really, you can see there's five pieces to this. Well, the first piece is the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award, which we received this year for the first time ever. Uh, there's only one other community in the entire state that's ever received that award. That's Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And what that really is about is uh, best practices in accounting and, 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 uh, and financial management. Uh, we are considered, between this and the Certificate of Achievement and Excellence in Financial Reporting, 20, 21 years in a row, that is the, uh, the, the longest streak in the government financial accounting world, we are considered the uh, Golden State Warriors or the Yukon Huskies <laughs> of uh, government financial um, management. And uh, this, is, this is very unusual. Uh, 21 years is a, an incredible mark. 
and again, it goes back to our uh, financial department in terms of what they've done. But really, the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence is all about transparency and disclosure. Do you make the information available and easily available and understandable to the community? And that's what that award is about, and we are, we are the best. Um, the next piece I'd like to talk about is the Standard & Poor's uh, bond rating AA+. And I'll tie that to the gender, uh, January bond sale of 1.881%. So we just went out for a bond sale. Uh, not, I think it was about 8.7 million, so let's round it off to about 9 million. Um, two years ago, before interest rates started to go up, we had a uh, bond sale, was, I think, I believe it was 2.6%. Um, two, to compare a 2.6% bond sale, which is an excellent bond sale, one of the best in the state, compared to a 1.881, the difference in that over the life of the issue of the bond is $737,000 in savings. So it shows you how important your financial rating is uh, in terms of coming up with a bond sale. Another community in the state just the other day went out and did a bond sale, very a major community, very highly regarded. They received a 3.13% bond rating. The difference between a 3.13 and a 1.881, which the city just received, it means we'll save an extra $1.18 million over the life of that bond. So again, that means the taxpayer has to generate that much less in taxes uh, to offset those bond costs. And again, uh, this budget that we're in now, it's the seventh consecutive balanced budget we've had. It's just, it's just what we do, it's just what the council does. When I turn the budget into the council uh, next month on May 6th, that's our goal. Uh, it'll be the eighth, so um, that's uh, quite a, quite a mark. But uh, again, to us, that's just the way business is done. To the rest of the world, that's quite an achievement. So, next slide. And this is the other financial slide. So I promise to keep it to two. This looks at the municipal uh, tax rate for 2015, the year that we're in now. Uh, and you can see we always hover. It's hard to see the communities on the bottom, but it's really uh, all these are this is all the cities. Concord is red and it, we're at 9.4, $9.40, and we're always about 8th, 9th, or 10th uh, in terms of uh, from highest to lowest, so we're down the lower end. Portsmouth is way down at 7.46, way to the right of the chart, and you can see we're clustered right around Lebanon and Rochester and Nashua, which is three or four of us always go back and forth. But uh, we're nowhere near uh, the Manchesters, the Franklins, the Keens uh, with their tax rates. and. Uh, Thank goodness. So that, that's the other financial chart. I'll leave it at that. And I just wanted to say we try to keep it that way. Council wants to stay near the bottom. We stay near the bottom to be competitive. I'm going to talk about a few capital projects, Sewell's Falls, Loudon Road, neighborhood uh, pa paving program, swimming pools, multi-generation community center, and exit 16. Sewell's Falls Bridge. So this is uh, moving along on time, on budget. The last section of the steel truss has been removed. The section of the abutment wall to the south side has uh, been completed. We're working on the north side. That will be done next month. That's the Concord Monitor side. You're going to see um, next month, you'll start to see the new piers going in. In addition to that, in, um, in June, you'll start to see structural steel being assembled. We plan to have the bridge open on time in November. And there's two points to this that I think you should understand. Uh, Dan St. Hilaire City Council of Dan St. Hilaire was instrumental in getting the $8 million from the federal government to help um, put this project together. This is an 80-20 match. The city comes up with the other 20%. Um, what we ended up doing was this was on the state's red listed bridge uh, uh, list, I should say, and we ended up, because of, of the skill sets that we have in the city, we convinced the state of New Hampshire that we would take it over. So Carlos, is, Carlos Baez's shop manages this. Uh, we took it over, we moved it faster than the state could move it, and we're going to move it very quickly. And the last thing I'd like to say is uh, the mayor was instrumental in making sure that when it came to federal financing for this, this was considered one of the top three projects in the entire state. There's, um, there's uh, the Mildred Long Bridge, there is I-93, and there's the Sewell's Falls Bridge. Those are the three major projects in the state of New Hampshire, and that's why we were able to get our financing to get this project underway. Loudon Road. So as you probably all know, the City Council had previously voted and financed um, a, a city share of taking Loudon Road from four lanes to three lanes and, and um, uh, starting the construction on that. Then what happened was the federal portion of that, which was 90%, was delayed. 
so in the meantime, the City Council, after talking to many people in the community, have gone back, looked at it, and tried to make a determination of whether or not to still go forward with that project and look at another uh, uh, plan for that. So, as a matter of fact, Mr. Bahia and myself are in discussions with the Department of Transportation to determine whether or not there is another uh, opportunity here to do something where to keep a four-lane cross-section but do improvements for crosswalk sections, um, access points to businesses, and uh, particularly lighting. And we're having those discussions and we'll be back to talk to the City Council about that probably in May. And it, that's, the, that's the time frame if we can do it with the idea of getting the construction done this calendar year. So, uh, so in the construction work would be just as it was on uh, the uh, water line project in, in Loudon Road, it would be done at night. So that project will be moving on. So just I want to bring that one up to keep, if you're interested in Loudon Road, keep tuned to that because we'll have new updates on that over the next month. Enhanced Neighborhood Paving Program. The City Council, as you know, has taken a lot of effort to improve all the collector and arterials in the city. Route 3 North, Main Street, we talk, just talked about Loudon Road, as others, Manchester Street is going to see some paving this year. Um, so now has decided because of those projects that get done, we can now turn the financing and the available tax dollars towards the local neighborhood uh, road pro program. So we're going to spend, we traditionally spend about a million dollars a year. So if you look over the next five years, that would traditionally be five million dollars. Council has upped it to 12.4 million dollars. Of that 12.4, Five million has already been appropriated, and you can actually can see that construction going on right now. In the next slide, it, one of the limitations on this is paving prices. And this is true for us, true for contractors. And you can see between 2005 and, and 2016, and prices have come down from $75 a ton to $71 a ton. However, that's a 69% increase in pricing. And that really limits how many miles of road you can get done on an annual basis. So hopefully we'll start to see that number keep going down. We go out to bid every year, and um, we hope to get more and more done. We had a great winter so far. I may snow again, right? I don't know. Uh, we, we, usually Mother's Day is the is the uh, is the is our drop dead day. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to put some more money to roads. Um, Mayor talked about in the um, Sippin and Chamber, and everybody talked about maintaining the quality of life in the community. Neighborhood pools are one of the important part of that. We're the only community that I know that has seven neighborhood pools in the Northeast, probably in the country, um, that are free, <laughs> available. Uh, I don't know, we're outlier, right? Um, so, but they all need to be replaced. A lot of them were built in the 30s and 40s. Uh, they're going to be $400,000 each. Where Rolf is underway right now, oh, Kimball is next. You'll, you'll see that in the budget. Followed by Keach the following year, and one of the important things I wanted to point out here is Concord Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Last year, last uh, summer, they provided us with $10,000, and we used that $10,000 to provide swimming lessons to all the children in the city, um, which means you, there's four sessions. Every child who wants to can get eight swimming lessons for a year, and this year they've agreed to give us $15,000 for that program, so the council will be seeing that. So uh, if you have a child, great opportunity. Don't, don't have a child just to get the swimming lessons. <laughs> Whereas Terry, Terry's got enough students as it is, but uh, uh, so. Uh, can, community center project, the um, city council on Monday approved moving forward. You can see there's really three buildings we picked up from uh, the Concord School District uh, for a dollar, thank you. It was before Terry, but I'll give Terry the credit. And we've decided there was a number of options, everything from about $3.3 .3 million, everything from closing it, to about a $3.5 million to just simply renovate it in place because the roof is gone, the, um, the uh, heating system is gone, everything's gone, um, to about a $17 million option. So the City Council went with a $6.5 million option, and uh, we're going to be stock construction of that soon, so you can go to the next one. Okay, so this is really what it's going to look like. Hopefully, uh, Frank LeMay will be interested in uh, <laughs> bidding on this project. Uh, <laughs> the award winning. The award winning, that's right. Uh, seven, and so when we, we actually have uh, $500,000 in the bank set aside for this already, so you put those two items together, we have $7.1 million. It'll be 30,000 square foot facility, 18,000 square foot existing, 11,000 would be new. Uh, three multi purpose rooms, two group exercise rooms, senior room. Back to the mayor's slide on slips and falls. 
The reason and one of the biggest importance for a multi-generational uh, community center is we want to have programs for seniors. We want to be able to have seniors get out of their house, get here, be active, have, have things for them to, that are interested in, but also get their health up. And this is going to be a great way to do that. So hopefully that will then see that translated back into fire department not having to go through many slips and falls uh, accidents in the future. We're going to also, as you know, when the Concord School District moved up to the north end of town, this whole area really doesn't have a lot of community services anymore. So we're going to include library services. And this will be in fiscal year. This is not going to be open until next fall, hopefully. At the, uh, hopefully. Um, so this will be fiscal year 18 for us. We're going to have a li library presence there. A park and recreation offices will be moved there. And we're going to also provide, when we city council also Monday night, it was a busy night, but we got through it pretty well, also approved a new contract uh, for uh, cable. And part of that contract is to allow a live drop at the center. So we'll be able to actually do live program cable casting from the center for not only educational purposes, but also for community workshops, neighborhood meetings and whatnot. So people will be able to watch that on, uh, live on TV. Exit 16 roundabout. This was approved by city council in this current budget. Uh, really what we're looking at here is uh, a, a uh, marrying of uh, cars, bicycles, and pedestrians and making it much more safe, sa safer for all of those folks and doing a, a roundabout project here. This has a design life of 20 years. When you do a major improvement like this, you want to have a 20-year uh, outlook to this. So we model this out to the year 20, 20, uh, 2036, I should say, and in 2036, this will have a, uh, a rating of A. So this will be the highest rating, you, which is the highest rating you can see, uh, see in terms of traffic movements through, through here. So you continue to get good traffic movement through here, but it'll be much safer for pedestrians and bicyclists. This is Store Street Extension. The, and this is just really a, uh, a draft plan that Matt Walsh has put together. Thank you, Matt. The, and what we're looking at is the City Council has appropriated some dollars to do a 25% design of connecting downtown over to the Convention Center. The, we're moving forward with that now in the, in the upcoming budget, which the Council will receive on May 6th. We're adding $400,000 to actually complete the design of this. And then I anticipate the following year about roughly, again, it's just preliminary right now, about $4.4 million to actually build this section of the Store Street North. That would be funded through the Tax Income and Financing District, which would essentially all the revenue produced because of the success of the uh, Grapponi Conference Center, thank you, and others, uh, Steve and Amanda, um, for putting that together. And um, again, a very successful project. Just so you know the way that worked, that whole site uh, where Concord Lumber was was valued at about $5 million when we got involved with it. It is now valued at over $50 million, and that generates that much more additional tax revenue, which then can be used to, to make these types of improvements happen. Pennacook Lake. I wanted to bring this slide up because of all the, dis all the issues and discussions you hear, seem to hear every day regarding water supplies throughout the country. Pennacook Lake, uh, that has been the city's water supply since 1892. Uh, it's 3.82 square miles of a watershed district, which the city owns all the property around the lake right now, and we're continuing to acquire pieces of property. Uh, it is one of the few Class A water bodies left in the state of New Hampshire that provides potable water to the, to the state. There is, uh, we have done testing. What you're reading about at Merrimack and other places, there's a uh, perfluorooctonic acid problem that is caused, which is a uh, EPA, uh, which EPA tests for, but is not considered a, uh, a problem right now. But I, I very soon expect that to be on the list of uh, health issues. The, um, we have tested for that. We, have, we do not have that issue. So I suggest if you go to other places, bring Concord water with you. Don't, <laughs> don't particularly Merrimack. Um, in other places, you, it's going to be tested for it. You just probably saw in the paper yesterday, Litchfield, Londonderry, other places, they all have water problems. You don't have water problems. What this, and w the, the reason for this is because we have um, not only protected the, 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 the water, the water uh, site, we also have um, five water tanks. We have 7.5 million gallons of uh, finished water, which we keep readily available. We produce 4 million gallons a day. During the summer, it's up to 5.5 million gallons a day for the community. Um, we are, have the only full-time water conservation technician in the state, so we're always looking for ways to make sure we preserve that water and make sure it's not leaking away. Um, 
and there's a lot of great things going. And the city council continues to invest in this. We have 172 miles of water line. Only six are left to be lined, and because the water lines are all ductile iron. So if you ever have an issue with um, uh, discoloration in the water, it's probably because you're on one of those six miles that needs still to be lined. Uh, and we have a very aggressive program about doing that, and that will be d done uh, very quickly. So that's all I have to say about um, capital projects, and be glad to we'll both be glad to answer any questions. If you look at <laughs> if you looked at Pennacook Lake, I think it was uh, Phil was out there fishing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, oh, there's a question there. Um, you mentioned Baby Manchester Street. Does that include any of the widening Manchester Street? Or just paving? Yeah. Okay. Just the paving. Really, it's from the Bridge uh, 93 section up to the uh, to overlay up to um, Dunkin' Donuts that section there. The, we had looked at doing the widening to a three-lane section all the way through to um, Merrimack County Savings Bank's branch out there, but we we're essentially waiting for other development to occur in that area to help pay for that cost. Um, as a matter of fact, we're actually starting to get a lot of interest out there um, by the old uh, cinema, the old drive-in site right now, so stay tuned for that. Uh, this last year, you really did a good job of coming up with an emergency shelter alternative for a year. Uh, what's in the budget to make sure that this isn't a crisis at the end of the, this coming fall? Great question. Um, <laughs> so we, we did. I mean, we kind of pulled the rabbit out of the hat for this year. Um, we had a very successful uh, year. Over 750 people from the city of Concord participated as volunteers to support that uh, shelter. That was an amazing thing. I think it, says it speaks well of, of, of you all in this room and because I know many of you volunteered and for the whole city. Um, one of the things that we noticed this year is we saw an uh, increased number of women and children who were in need of the shelter. So the, we had this interesting demand of the traditional population that you usually see. And I think what you'll find is there are about 20 or so folks who are kind of that chronic homeless that we saw most every night but there were another um, 40 or so people, I think it was, um, who were kind of that in and out, you know, uh, they might have been there for one night or two nights, and then they moved on. And we said, but this year it was mostly all conquered people. Whereas in the past, we were seeing people coming from Manchester and throughout the state. This year, this, we, serve, we truly served conquered resident uh, folks. So um, the question, obviously, that I've tried to avoid is what are we gonna do next year? Because I don't know the answer, um, <laughs> but, we, it's not, uh, well, I can tell you one thing, that we, we're not waiting until the last minute. We, there are already uh, discussions uh, with people a lot smarter than I to try to look for a location and to really find the right solution for the population that needs to be served. And that's the critical piece.